Hello everyone and welcome to this month's JK Tech webinar. So today's webinar will be about the JK Dropweight Tester and 30 years of the JK Dropweight Tester. 30 years ago, the first JK Dropweight Tester was commissioned at the Julius Krushnet Mineral Research Center in Brisbane, Australia. Many years of thinking, testing, failing, testing and thinking went into the question how to perform a standard lab scale test to replicate rock breakage inside an ag mill and of course eventually a sag mill. 30 years later and the JK drop weight tester is still the world's benchmark rock characterization test to determine their resistance to impact breakage with impact breakage, of course, being the main mechanism, breakage mechanism in crushes and sag mill. Today's presentation by Matt Weir describes the development history of the JK drop weight tester, the advent of the JK drop weight test and subsequent development of the SMC test. He'll also touch on current and future developments in place to ensure the precision and accuracy of the tests are maintained um, and improved. So without further ado, I will pass on to Matt for his presentation. Cool. Uh, thank you, Diana. Um, and thank you to everyone who has come along today for this little history lesson. Um, might be a little so shorter and sweeter than some of our webinars, but I'm glad that we've got some interest in this. Um, so as Diana said, we have just passed 30 years of having the JK drop weight tester. So obviously we think that's something worth noting and worth celebrating. So to start with a little bit about myself, um, I graduated from QT back uh, almost 20 years ago myself. I have a background in mineral characterization and analytical testing methods. Um, I joined JK Tech uh, around 2012 um, and got involved in the communication analysts side, uh, mostly focused on the JK drop weight and the SMC tests. Um, and we've helped develop a number of other tests since then. Uh, but essentially my job here at JK Tech is to be the liaison between us and the almost 40 labs around the world that perform these tests. A little bit about JK Tech and SMCT. Uh, JK Tech was founded in 1986 <clears throat> to uh, commercialize and transfer to industry the research done at the Sustainable Minerals Institute and in particular at the JK Minerals Research Council. Um, <clears throat> and one of our early uh, Techno successful technology transfers was the JK drop weight, which came out of research and has since been taken up by the industry. Um, subsequent to that, uh, SMCT was founded and the SMCT test develops a bit over 10 years later in 2004. So where were we back in the 80s and 90s that got us thinking about creating this test up. Um, the change in industry back around that time was the introduction of SAG mills, uh, SAG and AG mills. Um, as you can see, they sort of started appearing just in the 1950s, uh, but it was the 1970s and 1980s when the popularity really took off um, and becoming widespread into the 1990s and beyond. Um, a lot of the seminal communition work um, done by people like Fred Bond and others was mostly done before this time. So there was a bit of a gap in the theory and the modeling around sag mills and how to properly characterize them and understand them. At the JK MRC around that time in the 1980s, um, we had started looking at simple particle breakage um, by Narian and Witten mostly, and 
those guys were using a twin pendulum test as a way of breaking single particles uh, with controlled energy levels. Uh, there's a little diagram there. Uh, you can see how they did it. Uh, you have your impact pendulum, uh, raise it up. Um, the rock was basically, as I'm told, basically sticky taped to the rebound pendulum. Um, and there was a lot of computer controlled with that to uh, measure or to determine the actual input energy from that rebound of the rebound pendulum. Uh, at the time, this was still in the scale of four mils, um, mostly looking at particles, maybe up to 10 millimeters in size. Um, in the late 80s, they started trying to push this concept uh, larger so they could look at larger particles that are more suited to the sag mill material. Um, just as a comparison, I've got down the bottom there a bit of a uh, indication of the energy levels that could be achieved using that uh, pendulum setup. Um, and probably the one to note is that the maximum energy we're limited to was about 3.3 kilowatt hours per ton. So the researchers at the time were looking at single particle breakage um, and they're hitting these limitations of what they're using. Uh, so that got them thinking, trying to determine a new way that they could break single particles uh, in a controlled manner, um, and in particular to break bigger particles and to break them at higher energies. And they came up with a very simple idea of, let's just drop a weight on the particle. Um, obviously it's simple physics to know uh, the energy achieved from a certain weight drop from a certain height um, and we can scale up and get up to about, well, at the moment we, we get up to 63 millimeter particles. Um, we could probably go a little bit bigger with our machines, but that's the size our standard test goes to. Um, <clears throat> and through that variation of our drop height and our drop weights, um, the drop weight can be changed out, as I'm sure most of you know, um, from around three kilos up to 50 kilos. Um, and that allows a wide range of energies to be achieved. Um, and as a comparison to that previous slide, you can see that we can now, for those smaller particles, achieve over 10 times the energy um, that was achieved in the twin pendulum tests. Um, and this allows the current JK drop weight tester to get into that realm where we're actually breaking particles of an equivalent size and breaking them with equivalent energies to what you'd actually see in practice in the SAG mill. So we're now getting more towards breaking rocks under the conditions we want to know about um, so we can understand what's happening in those AG and SAG mills. Um, and just to complement this, um, obviously impact breakage isn't the only breakage mechanism that occurs in these tumbling mills. Um, there's also abrasion and attrition in there as well. Uh, so the JK drop weight test is supplied with an abrasion mill, which is used as part of the standard JK drop weight test. Because um, again, coming back, what we want to do is understand what's happening in those sag mills. So the test developed and needs to be able to characterize all the mechanics that are happening in that mill. So between the drop weight tester and the abrasion mill, that lets us look at both the high energy impact breakage that occurs, as well as that low energy abrasion and attrition that will occur in the mill. Um, just to touch on what we get from the JK drop weight test results, um, everyone knows obviously the famous A times B, uh, that's only a small part of the picture. Um, A and B are important parameters in their own right, um, in particular the A parameter. 
the TA there, uh, which is the abrasion parameter, which comes from that abrasion section of the test. Uh, back in 2015, we introduced the SAG circuit specific energy parameter. Um, that's coming from a point. We realized there's some, some limitations in the understanding of A times B and some problems uh, in how it's used and as a benchmark. So we wanted to create a parameter that was more intuitive. Um, and the SCSE is given in kilowatt hours per ton. Um, and it's the expected draw, power draw of that ore through a very basic circuit. So your SCSE is probably a parameter much more that engineers and designers have a better intuitive grasp on. Uh, we also give the specific gravity, of course, which is part of the test. Um, and the JK drop weight also gives crusher power data and crusher appearance function, uh, which is important information about the energy required to break different particle sizes. And also, gives information about the product size distribution you'll get from that breakage. Here is some pretty standard uh, JK drop weight results. Um, I've just pulled this slide and the next slide from just some results basically pulled at random from this year. Um, and this is part of what you would get from a JK drop weight test. Uh, this shows your energy T10 points. Um, T10 is our method of putting a number to the amount of breakage that occurs. So a higher T10 means a higher amount of breakage. Um, I will also say at the moment, if you want more information uh, about all these parameters and how they're used, uh, we do have a previous webinar that I presented, um, which is about half an hour of me talking about those parameters, what they are and how they're used. Um, so if you want more detail about those, uh, please go see that webinar. Um, but the curve you can see at the moment, this is where A and B come from. A and B are the parameters that describe the shape of that curve. And hence, describe how much breakage you get <clears throat> from a certain amount of energy impacted. Uh, one thing we'll note is that the famous AB curve uh, equation has no size, particle size component in it. Uh, but understanding how the hardness <clears throat> changes with particle size uh, is a large part of the JK drop weight test um, and does come out in that crusher energy table. Um, but just to round up, I thought I would share we can actually calculate and we do calculate the A times B for every size fraction that we get um, in our JK drop weight samples. Um, and here, I just thought I'd share these as a few examples of how that relationship changes over different ores. And that relationship between the particle size and the A times B is unique uh, for pretty much every ore tested. Um, and you see it's usually a reasonably linear relationship, uh, but if you can look at those numbers closely, you can see the amount of change over that particle size range can be um, either quite limited or it can be quite significant. Okay, and final little slide about our results. This is uh, the other important section. This is the crusher power and appearance function tables. Um, that top section, the appearance function, that relates the amount of breakage, that relates to the product size distributions that we get um, as we do the full product size distribution on the breakage products from the JK drop weight test. Um, so using that top table, JK Simmet <clears throat> can model uh, the breakage and model what the product size distribution coming out will be um, and let you know that. Uh, the bottom section lets you know uh, how much energy is required 
uh, versus particle size and the amount of breakage required. So the three rows in that uh, are looking at T10 values of 10, 20, or 30. So basically you can think of those as the top row is if you break it a little bit and the bottom row is if you break it a lot. And then the columns tell you how much energy you need uh, depending on what particle size you're looking at. And again, you can see uh, how that changes over the particle sizes that we're looking at. Um, and it can take, in this case, almost twice as much energy to break the smaller particles than it does to break the larger ones. <clears throat> Um, and so why, why are we getting these results that we're getting? Why did we design the JK drop weight test to give us these results? Why did we analyze our results to come up with this? And it's because this is what uh, the researchers and the modelers needed for those communication models packages that are in JK CIMET. Um, as you see from the slide, JK CIMET had been around for a few years before the advent of the JK drop weight test. So they were working on all the models that were going to JK CIMET uh, that are used to model the various communication uh, processes that are used in practice. So the researchers there wanted the models to be able to model those ag and sag mills. Um, and that drove the development of the JK drop weight test and drove the parameters that come out of it. So that those parameters could be then used in the models uh, that are now built into JK SIMMET. So that is a large driving force behind why we get what we get from the JK drop weight test. And this is where it feeds in to JK SIMMET. Um, I'm hopefully a number of you are aware and I've um, had some play with JK SIMMET and obviously all the different sections have their own models behind them that are used to simulate them. And the JK drop weight test results go into both the crushes and the sag mill models. And as you can note in the second point there, we are looking at the full feed and product sizing. So we're not just looking at F80s going to P80s. Um, and just briefly to touch on the SMC test, um, as it's <laughs> very uh, well regarded as the sister test of the JK drop weight test. Um, so to where that fits in, um, Dr. Steve Morell um, had been a researcher at the JK uh, before going independent and starting his own consulting business. Um, and in that time, he saw that market desire for a characterization test like the JK drop weight test, but using less material. Um, and in particular, it was a need to work with drill core uh, for those very early exploratory and maybe even pre fizz studies. Um, and this led to him developing the SMC test. Um, but then, as he was well aware of the JK drop weight test, uh, he saw the advantage in using it um, and in using our existing laboratory network for the SMC test. Um, and so that's <clears throat> where our partnership started with SMCT, and it has been a quite productive partnership for both of us uh, to this day. Um, and for most of you out there, uh, I'm basically your agent for SMC, um, and yeah, <laughs> I look after Steve and act as a go-between uh, for everyone out there doing the SMC tests. So how, how has this gone after we got introduced? Um, so as you can see here, we now have 81 of our testers sold around the world. Um, starting from the 1990s, uh, the 2010s were pretty good. We had a big uptake, but yeah, the sales have con continued steadily and um, we are still, still getting machines, still getting queries and machines getting put out there to this day. 
Um, we are located in 17 countries around the world. Oh, sorry, I'm just um, to go back. Our testers, they are mostly commercial, um, say 90% of our machines are in commercial laboratories. Uh, but we also do have some in-house and some educational ones out there. Uh, presently located in 17 countries. Uh, we have over 6,000 full JK drop weight tests performed. And just last year, SMC passed 70,000 uh, tests performed. Um, unfortunately, we can't really put an exact number on the total number of uh, drop weight tests. 6,000 is the number that have come through the JK Center. Uh, but we really don't know how many hundreds have been done by the in-house testers because they keep that all in-house uh, because of the agreements at the time. So obviously, I hope one of the big selling points for the JK drop weight test in the SMC is the quality of them. And I think that quality has been proven uh, through their increased use over the years and the fact that they have become industry standard bankable tests. Um, so how do we ensure that quality? Uh, we do that, that all results are reviewed uh, by myself and SMC results are reviewed by, SM, uh, by SMC. Um, and we're just checking those issues. Um, there's always little issues that come up. They're mostly just data entry issues, uh, things getting swapped around. Um, and we can pick them up before they go through. Uh, we are continuing support for the licensed laboratories. Uh, we are always available to assist. Um, often uh, <clears throat> as staff turnovers happen in the laboratories, uh, we can touch base and keep them all on the same page. And if they have problematic samples or some sampling issues, uh, they can come to us hopefully before they start breaking rocks and we can talk them through and work with them and determine the best way to proceed with some of those problematic samples. Um, our major quality assurance program is the comparative testing program, or otherwise known as the round robin. Uh, all our commercial laboratories have to do that. I'm also happy to say that a lot of the in-house and educational ones also join in. Um, and for our last uh, last program, we had 37 testers uh, taking part all around the world. Um, and that is a very rigorous uh, program where every tester does duplicate samples. And that really enables us to look at the spread of the results um, and how much variability there is in the test and really put some good numbers onto the accuracy and precision of our tests. Uh, <clears throat> we are just starting on the next round robin. Uh, they are, they are uh, quite a bit of work. We're looking at processing around uh, 15 tons of material. Um, so yeah, it's a work in progress and hopefully we'll have another program done in about a year or so. So what's changed over the drop weight tester over the past and what changes are we looking at making in the future? Um, we feel that one of the real strengths of the JK drop weight tester is its simplicity. Um, it's got very few moving parts. Uh, it's designed that it can actually be installed at remote sites. Really all you need to run it is some compressed air. Um, so we don't really want to make it that much more complicated. Um, the more simple it is, the less things there are to go wrong um, and the less places there are for you to get caught up. Uh, having said that, we are currently on version five of our tester um, with pretty much all the previous changes um, being driven by safety and ease of use issues. Um, and it's been the introduction of things like interlocks and safety stops um, and things like swapping out buttons for toggle switches just to make the machine safer and just easier to use for the, for the technicians out there who are spending their day standing at these machines and breaking their rocks with them.
we've uh, got a current program we're looking at simplifying the um, the number of weights used um, because at the moment there is quite a number of combinations of weights and we're thinking that that actually might be a little superfluous so we're looking at simplifying that again that's going to be another ease of use um, update uh, other potential projects that we're looking at uh, is the use of a laser diode uh, to measure that drop velocity um, to actually ensure that not too much friction is occurring and that those drop heads are falling at that assumed velocity. Uh, we're looking at the increase, uh, increase in the available energy range and particle sizes possible. Um, again, that goes back to maybe increasing the drop height or just increasing that drop mass to be able to get larger energies. Um, and on top of that, we're looking at other ways that we can increase automation and maybe uh, tie in with automated data logging uh, to make that easier for those people out there. Uh, 